So this video is going to be about the power of a study. That title sounds like maybe an editorial about how great studies are or, or aren't. Or it also sounds like maybe a superhero or supervillain uh, story about Captain Study or something. It's neither. This is a technical term. Power of a study is the ability how many people have to be included, subjects have to be included in a study to create the power to say, is this, the hypothesis correct or not? Now, <clears throat> so if you're not interested in that sort of thing, you may not want to watch this video. Um, <clears throat> however, before you do, I will uh, tell you this. There is another component. This study does allow me to give my favorite rant. And my favorite rant is the failure to prevent heart attack and stroke associated with diabetes. Why is that coming up with this study? This is the VA uh, diabetes trial uh, that was published in the New England Journal back in 2009. There were a series of trials. That trial, the ACCORD trial, uh, EDIC trial, several of them showed what really surprised a lot of people. But before I describe that, um, that surprise, let me just give a brief introduction. My name is Ford Brewer. Uh, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R. -E -E I started off as an ER doc, um, and if you work as an ER doc, you become very uh, inundated with people coming in with bad problems, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, car wrecks, most of which could have been prevented. Uh, not all, and maybe not forever, but most of which could have been prevented at least to a large extent. And so that created a passion for me for prevention. Um, at that point in time, we're talking over 30 years ago, um, most preventive medicine took you into being a bureaucrat, either an epidemiological science uh, uh, guru, st statistician, or public health guy. And I said, you know what, this is not about me. It's about helping prevent disease. So I risked becoming a bureaucrat. Uh, I still did become one to some uh, to some extent. I've, my career has not been in um, uh, science or public health so much as it is has been in managing large groups of uh, primary care docs. Uh, the largest being oh gosh, four or five hundred docs um, in a uh, a group called Premise several years ago. They had over 500, at the time I was there, they had over 500 clinics, um, primary care clinics, where my role was to help um, improve the prevention. Um, I've also worked in some other areas as well. But that's enough of the introduction. Let's just talk about this concept again. Why uh, was this trial a big deal in terms of diabetes prevention? Because it it created a lot of inertia. All these studies showed <clears throat> a surprising effect. And that effect was, if you have uh, a patient who's had a decade of diabetes, they're older, they've got an A1C of 8, it does not decrease heart attack and stroke on an immediate basis to drop their A1C down to 6.8. That was a major blow to a lot of people, and it was totally... Uh, counterintuitive. To me, it doesn't, it's not that surprising. These people had diabetes for over uh, a decade in most of these trials. And those of, uh, those of, uh, of us who uh, are familiar with the information covered in this channel know that you'll tip it, the diabetes um, diagnosis is so there's so much delay to making that diagnosis that people typically will have prediabetes or metabolic syndrome for a decade or two, and sometimes three, before a diagnosis of diabetes is ever made. There's a whole bunch of political and other reasons why that's the case, but it's tragic because that is the time to achieve improved control, and that is the time that we will prevent heart attack and stroke for diabetics. So that was my rant. Uh, let's for now for the uh, the science geeks. Let's go in and talk about power of a study. So this goes in back to the VADT, the VA uh, diabetes trial that was in um, January of '09, 
And here was a, you know, so again, they ticked off a lot of people when they said, you control the diabetes better and we're, we're not seeing an improvement in heart attack and stroke. One of the people they ticked off, evidently, was uh, Solomon Burr-Bannerer. He was at uh, Dallas Diabetes and Endocrine Center, and uh, he didn't like this. Or he made some comments about the study. Again, so he wrote an editorial. It was published four months later, May 7th in 2009. And again, he's talking about the glucose uh, control VA trial. So here, it's worth uh, reading a couple of things about it. Basically, what he said was, look, they didn't meet their pre-specified study uh, recommendations. Their pre-specified recommendations was um, that they would get a 40% difference. They'd get a 40% decrease in, uh, or that they would get a 40% uh, rate of heart attack and stroke in the standard therapy group. What they actually got was 33%. Now that's interesting. Does that mean that the quote standard group were actually getting better than standard care? And is there a hidden Im improvement in heart attack and stroke uh, in that hidden group? Uh, the, the difference there? So that's clearly an opportunity for bias. He then goes on to say, look, <clears throat> There was also a, de uh, a decrease in the, uh, in the follow-up. Uh, you had a significant amount. The observed drop, dropout rate of 14% was far higher than the predicted uh, dropout rate of 5%. So here's the other potential bias. Did that extra 10% or 9% were these people that were in the standard group, standard therapy group, had a uh, heart attack or stroke or died and were lost to follow up because of that heart attack or stroke. And, and therefore, that's why you missed a big and very real improvement in heart attack and stroke due to um, uh, better treatment, <clears throat> tighter control. So here was their response. No, that's not what happened. Uh, we did have slow recruitment. Because of that slow recruitment, we extended the recruitment time from two, uh, two years to 2.5. In addition, we extended the follow-up time period as well, from seven years to 7.5 years. The results of that added uh, six months on both ends of this study was we had uh, the power of the study that we ex expected and prevent, uh, presented earlier. Now, why didn't we describe all of that in the setting? It's a very real issue. Um, the information was not in, included in the original study because of word count limits. It's high dollar real estate in the, in the New England Journal, and you gotta really uh, hone down the words that you use, <laughs> the numbers, just strict number of words. So I, I think that was a good uh, response. And again, I think these studies are real. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have, you drop a hemoglobin A1C from uh, 8 to 6.8 after 30 years of someone burning up their arteries. I'm not, with prediabetes and then another decade of diabetes, I'm not surprised that doesn't decrease heart attack and stroke. What I am continually surprised about is the number of people that are letting this go on in their arteries right now today under the blessing and advice from their doctor to do so. So power, what, what is the power of a study um, and how do you do a power analysis? For most common statistical tests, power is easily calculated uh, from tables or using statistical uh, computer software. <clears throat> the power formula can get a little bit um, dicey in terms of uh, the algebra. And here it is. So again, um, one of the branches of preventive medicine is to look at uh, uh, study populations and be able to detect what's causing disease and what isn't. And the ability to do power of a study uh, is clearly one of the skills of a preventive medicine doc. I don't, I, and I used to be able to walk you through that geometry. Not anymore. Uh, again, I've been involved in 30 years of um, on the job 
helping docs prevent disease, not so much this part. So uh, here's another way of looking at it. The, uh, obviously, the algebra gets very confusing, but here's what the study is. And again, the study scientists are always uh, sometimes confusing things because of their perspective. And this is one of those times. They talk about the null hypothesis. In this case, the null hypothesis would be what? Let's go back and look at what the original hypothesis was. The original hypothesis was if you decrease somebody's uh, hemoglobin A1C from 8 to 6.8 in an advanced diabetic, you'll decrease heart attack and stroke. What would the null hypothesis be? No, you don't. You can decrease the A1C from 8 down to 6.8, but you're not going to decrease the heart attack and stroke at that point. So here's how the study, uh, the power of the study uh, basically looks in a two by two table. Uh, the null hypothesis is, uh, if the null hypothesis is true and you do, do not reject it in the study, that's the case. And again, I know that there's that backwards logic of you don't reject the null hypothesis exactly. What does that mean? Again, welcome to the world of epidemiologists. Um, they didn't have to do that, <clears throat> but they did. Uh, how about if you the null hypothesis is true, but you reject it? Well, that would be a very misleading study. And that's exactly what Dr. Bannerer was, was concerned about and complaining. You know what? Maybe uh, this study was underpowered and the results were negative, so why are we worried about it? He was saying, maybe that was over here. Um, and these two uh, squares are, the null hypothesis is false. In other words, it does help. Actually, given that, that's where he was saying this was. Maybe the null hypothesis was false. Uh, it does decrease heart attack and stroke, but we missed it because we rejected the null hypothesis because the study was underpowered. For those of you geeks who have still made it this far, thank you very much for your perseverance.